Good evening, and welcome to the May edition of the Columbia League of Women Voters Presents, which is your monthly public affairs program. Tonight, we're going to be talking about uh, issues about your health. My name is Randy Picht. I'm the executive director of the Donald W. Reynolds Journalism Institute at the University of Missouri, and I'll be your host tonight. Um, tonight, we'll be talking about four kind of big issues that uh, have been in the news and, and sometimes uh, pop up in the news, and also one very small uh, kind of pesky topic, and we'll get to that in a minute. Um, but first, let me introduce my panel to esteemed epidemiologists. To my immediate left is Dr. Michael Cooperstock, who's an uh, infectious disease specialist and a professor emeritus from the University of Missouri School of Medicine. And next to him is Eddie Hedrick, who's retired from the Missouri uh, State Health Department and he's an expert in emerging and re-emerging diseases and uh, conditions. So um, we have four subjects, we have a lot of ground to cover, so let's do the best we can. And why don't we start with one of the issues that, that uh, keeps coming up in the news, and that's immunization. So Dr. Cooperstock, could you tell us a little bit about some of the big, uh, some, maybe some of the myths that we need to talk about and some of the, some of the other important issues? Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Uh, <clears throat> the subject of immunizations is uh, near and dear to my heart, and for good reasons. Um, the, the history of medicine is such that for all of the major events that we've heard about, the great discoveries over the last hundred years in medicine, the one that stands out as being the most important in terms of human health is immunizations. It tends to uh, be a victim of its own success in a sense, because when immunizations are successful, we don't see anything. <laughs> and what we've been missing because of immunizations are a whole host of very serious illnesses we know a lot about through the history of medicine. And we've seen serious illness after serious illness fall in the face of the development of these vaccines. Um, so we're at a time now where we have immunizations against a wide range of serious illnesses. We give them routinely to our children. Um, and uh, we're happy that we don't see any effect of that except the absence of serious illnesses. There are so many of those that go back through history and all through my career in the last four decades, I've seen this happen over and over and over again. Diseases like pneumonia, serious forms of pneumonia. We see children in the hospital with these things. Uh, one of the worst was meningitis, for which we now have two major vaccines that are just the routine part of childhood uh, immunization practice with your doctor. Um, it's hard sometimes for people to appreciate the um, incredible importance of these immunizations because they've been so successful. Yet, almost without exception, they remain important because we know from experience after experience around the world, in our own country and elsewhere, uh, that when immunizations are not given or are held back or are delayed, we start to see these illnesses come back and rear their ugly head. There's still pockets of these things in the third world. They find their way back here. Uh, there's a lot of, 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 of um, pieces to this. You know, we, we recently had a lot of uh, publicity about measles, for example, and if mm -hmm. you'd like, we can talk about that a little bit. Uh, there's a big story behind influenza immunization, a disease that still kills far more people than almost any other infectious illness there is in the world to date. In the United States, we lose an average of about 25,000 people die from influenza. Much of it is preventable uh, with the proper use of vaccines, for example. So these are all very important issues. Do you think that because of kind of the, uh, the internet and the spread of information in maybe unreliable sources that that's causing some issues for immunizations and people are sort of reacting in a way that we haven't seen before? Yeah, and I think you're leading up to the concerns we have about all of the negative things we've heard in, in recent years about vaccines of all sorts. Again, that's a spin-off of the success of the vaccines because people grow up not really fully appreciating what it is that we're preventing. They haven't experienced, they haven't seen it. 
Um, and um, so even if a person gets measles, they usually get through it. It's a pretty severe illness. Get through it in 10 days, high fever, and that's about it. Um, but about one in a thousand, as an example here, uh, will develop either a serious brain, permanent brain injury or death hmm. because of this vaccine. And you say, well, one in a thousand, those are pretty good odds. But when you count them all up and you've got uh, 10 or 100,000 children potentially getting these diseases, that adds up to a large number of kids that are suffering from this sort of illness. Uh, and there are other things with measles. We just learned in the last week that people who have had measles are uh, more susceptible to other infections, not only while they're having the measles, but even years later, it somehow has a permanent effect on the immune system. Uh, totally unexpected, uh, but we're just starting to hear about that now. So there's so many benefits of these immunizations. And then what has happened, there have been certain illnesses, serious illnesses of children, autism and others, uh, that have somehow gotten blamed uh, as being caused by these vaccines. Um, and we know a lot, there are books written on how this came about. Uh, and it was because of misinformation and bad science. Uh, people uh, drawing conclusions from data that subsequently turned out to be incorrect. Mm. And many, many studies since then have proven really as much as we prove anything in medicine that the measles vaccine is safe. Mm. And yet the idea that it can do something bad is still there and it comes up over and over and over. As wrong as it is, and there's probably not an intelligent mother out there who doesn't have some kind of a twinge when she hears her child is about to get a vaccine because she's heard this stuff. Right. Even even uh, educated people. It, and as a parent, you know, you always want to protect your child. Uh, and so even with, for the people that are going ahead, they know it's the right thing to do. They trust their pediatrician or their family practice doctor to go ahead and give these immunizations. They still are thinking twice because of this thought that's still in the air. And that is very, very bothersome to me. So the, the lesson is immunizations are very important and we should get them every chance we can. <laughs> Absolutely, and on time. And on time, and, and it's pretty easy to get them. There's many places you can get immunized. Well, if, if any physician who's taking care of children will offer immunizations as part of the routine practice. You can get immunizations through the health department. Um, and it's, uh, it's a matter of just getting it done. It's a little bit awesome. There's, we can protect against so many illnesses now it involves many, many shots that these kids have to go through. There's work going on to make it fewer and to, to move from injectable to oral vaccines. And that's a slow process. So at the present time, a child does have to go through a large number of immunization shots um, in order to get fully protected. But the benefits so far outweigh the risks. Uh, that there's just no question. It's, it's really, when, when all the facts are laid out, it's almost a no-brainer to know what's the right thing to do. And that's really what to focus on, the benefits versus the risks. Absolutely. Right. All right, that's great. So let's um, move on to the next big issue, and that's um, another issue that's been in the news, uh, maybe less so, but still scary, which is Ebola. And uh, Eddie, I know you've been sort of carrying the water for that around the state and talking about it and trying to explain where it is in terms of uh, this country and, and traveling to Africa and that kind of stuff. So maybe you can give us an update on kind of where we are. Well, I think that uh, when we were talking earlier, Mike said it's pretty much gone from the United States. Uh, we haven't seen any more cases since uh, several weeks ago when you heard, you know, all of the uh, press about it. But in the in Africa, Liberia, since May 9th now, is considered uh, Ebola-free. Uh, Sierra Leone and uh, Guinea both have seen cases in the last couple of weeks. I think uh, 12 cases in, in uh, New Guinea, and uh, they just had today, they reported several cases in Sierra Leone. Uh, what they're doing is contact tracing. One of the nice things about Ebola is it's hard to get. And it's if you do contact tracing and you can follow who's been in direct contact with body fluids from somebody who uh, has a disease, you have a good chance of tracking it down. And it's, uh, the good news is it's like a, a genealogy tree. They've been able to track back to uh, patient zero in this outbreak and all the way through. So they're pretty confident that they're gonna bring this under control this year. 
Um, it's been around since 1976. That's when we first discovered it in, in uh, Zaire, and uh, you know what is it, the Ebola River, uh, and basically. Uh, we see sporadic outbreaks in different parts of Africa, but this is the largest in history and uh, has, I think, over 27,000 cases now that we've seen with over 11,000 deaths. So there, there are many different uh, types of hemorrhagic fever viruses, and this happens to be the worst one, the Ebola Zaire. Uh, there are five other species, or four other species besides this one, but this is the one that uh, has the highest mortality rate associated with it. The good news is primarily transmitted through contact with body fluids from somebody who has it. So those at greatest risk are family members and healthcare workers. Uh, over 90% of the cases in Africa that we've seen have had something to do with burial rites yeah. and rituals. People there uh, in their burial uh, process will often cleanse the body. And at the point where somebody is uh, has died from this, is very sick, uh, there's a lot of leakage of body fluids, so they have a tendency to come in contact with that. So changing some of those processes now where they're uh, washing the bodies with, uh, you know, disinfectants and putting them immediately into a coffin and trying to bury them on their property as they normally would instead of in mass graves where there's not, it's not as, uh, uh, socially acceptable uh, has really made a big difference in slowing it down in these countries. So I think folks in, in Missouri are, would be nervous about people coming into the country with Ebola, but it sounds like maybe things, have, things are more contained and maybe it's, as you said, very difficult to get Ebola. Yeah, and, and one of the things that public health has been doing since the very beginning is pretty much, uh, and they've intensified this as time's gone on, is anybody coming from an epidemic area is now, whether they're low risk or high risk, they make contact with the health department when they come in. And we actually will ask them, if you get sick, where would you like to go hmm. for care? and follow them very carefully that they're taking their temperature every day uh, and that they're, they're monitoring uh, themselves. And our health departments actually will go in to the homes and, and do that with them, uh, depending upon their risk. But in doing that, uh, we've seen hundreds of cases or hundreds of people coming here from those parts of the world to Missouri and they're all being monitored very closely as that occurs. So. Uh, I think that uh, that's one of the real keys to this is contact tracing and monitoring people for symptoms. And if you can catch it early, then usually you can uh, contain the disease. Yeah. I got to say this is, whole story is quite a story. Um, as, as Ebola emerged and we got uh, evidence of the size of the problem in West Africa and the seriousness of the disease, uh, none of us knew where it was going to go, how long it was going to increase and what were the really were the risks of it coming to us. Uh, so all over the United States, including at our place at the University of Missouri, uh, uh, a great deal of effort was made to s prepare for it. Uh, and I think in general around the country, uh, it was good. But the thing that makes this story uh, especially interesting is it's really, there's very little hard science in this. Uh, there, uh, it, 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 there are vaccines being developed and the microbiology of it and the genetics of it are being worked out. But those are things that are still in progress. We don't even have a vaccine yet. We're getting very close to it. But the disease was contained by people, well, people like Eddie, who have devoted their careers to just what we call shoe leather epidemiology. It's going out there, s seeing hmm. what you can learn about how it transmits from one person to another, really by just observing what's going on and then looking for ways that you can intervene. And the idea of uh, the way a body is handled turned out to be, as Eddie mentioned, so important. Uh, you know, and that's a time in the course of the disease where we know now the amount of virus coming from that person, it goes up and up and up and up as you get sicker and sicker. So there's huge amounts of virus just pouring off. Uh, and uh, that alone, and realizing how to do that. And so then we finally began to see the curve going up and then finally flattening out and now going way down again. Mm. Um, and so the end is clearly in sight, I think. Yeah, and, and I think one of the, the myths that we've had to deal with is, uh, it was in the 
pressed several times that uh, this could become airborne. And really, it's very unusual for a disease to change its uh, mode of transmission. And one of the ways we know how this is transmitted is if you go into the household of people who have it to see who else gets it. And there's only 65% of the people in the households remain disease free. It's only those that handle the body or have very close contact with body fluids. Mm. So that gives us, you know, airborne diseases affect everybody and we wouldn't be able to trace it as well if it were truly airborne. Uh, but in fact, in this case, we actually have a genealogic tree where it can trace pretty much every case. It's quite fascinating to me that we've got that good, but we've gone right back to a little kid being exposed to a bat in a tree mm. where the uh, patient zero was. Mm. So, and then he's infected his relatives, et cetera. So. Yeah. And I think this story and the measles vaccine story and much of the history of medicine uh, has these side stories of how people's emotions yeah. jump in and we get led astray or the public gets led into these thoughts that something horrible is, more, is there when the data don't support it. Uh, and these ideas have a way of just sort of yeah. taking off. And well, I think that's the theme for tonight's show is, yeah. is exactly what you just said. We spend I, a good deal of time just spelling myths like that. Well, we so the, what we, about like um, the other subject we we're going to talk about is the superbugs, which is another one that really scares people yeah. because mm -hmm. the, there, you know, there's all this idea that we don't, we can't treat it and, and you're going to okay. get it. I just, I hate the word superbugs because <laughs> that's what everybody wants to call them. They're really not super. They basically <laughs> no. are antibiotic resistant and, and there are different levels of antibiotic resistance. They, so when we say superbug, they put some kind of moniker on them like they can do something to you that others can't. The See, main thing we're is, doing it again. Yeah. And perhaps the press is part of the <laughs> whole problem. Okay, well. Well, I, I've even had to deal with that with one of the previous governors. I said, please don't call this when we're talking about MRSA on a TV show. I said, please don't call this a superbug. And he said it five times within the first minute. <laughs> <laughs> so I think, I think the, the key here is we're a victim again of our own success in that the, uh, the magic bullet came out our antibiotics and all of a sudden we're curing all kinds of diseases and thought disease are, infectious diseases are going to go away. But the overuse, misuse, not only in this country, uh, probably even worse in a lot of countries where they sell these drugs over the counter, where a lot of these bugs come from. Uh, so they're just trying to survive. You know, they, they reproduce very rapidly and as a result they uh, mutate and become resistant. So uh, the fact that we use these antibiotics on a routine basis just allows them to do that. And it, one of the big problems today is we're just running out of do antibiotics. So, and I, and I do not want to downplay the importance of this issue because um, we do see patients who have these resistant bacteria and they're very difficult to treat sometimes. Um, and uh, we can even feel helpless about it. Um, when an, the whole question of antibiotic resistance is really what we're talking about, as Eddie said, uh, first came to light when penicillin and even before that when we just had sulfa drugs as the first antibiotics when I was born when these things first started to, to emerge. And we had experts saying and warning, you know, be careful about overusing antibiotics because they, we know they can become resistant. Even back at the beginning, we knew there was antibiotic resistance. So it's an issue we've been struggling with for a long, long time. And over the years, it's changed because uh, the nature of the bugs has changed. The uh, numbers of antibiotics we have is enormous now. Um, uh, but the basic issue of overuse of antibiotics and the issues relating to infection control practices, sort of like we were talking about with the bodies of Ebola, also the kinds of just practical way we handle situations in a hospital, for example, um, can make a big difference. And there's where I can point to of some very large successes, <clears throat> and that is in the whole area of infection control within hospitals. Uh, Eddie was our infection control chief for years, and uh, he left us a legacy that's continued to grow and develop so that uh, in hospitals all over the country, and I think uh, the University of Missouri and other hospitals here in town too, are among the leaders in containing these problems. So when we used to see years ago, people coming in the hospital and acquiring infections, mm -hmm. it was sort of a way of life. And we gradually began to realize we can do something about it. And it all goes back to shoe leather epidemiology. Simple practices can make a big difference if they're applied in the right way. And we've seen that happen in over the last 
oh, 10 or 15 years, we've seen the rates of hospital infections go down and down and down and down and down and down. And when I thought the last few years that we couldn't get any lower, they still have gone lower mm -hmm. and lower uh, just by doing practical uh, care practices. And I guess, it, it, you know, the hospitals is, is very important, but also, as you said, the overuse of antibiotics is another issue. It's kind of interesting where you're here saying we need to do more on the more vaccinations and less antibiotics. And so right as long as people just keep those two general concepts in mind, uh, you know, things will go better. Right? I think most people want to treat everything with an antibiotic. And that's one of our big issues is most of the infectious diseases they have are viral and the antibiotics won't touch them, but they want, to, they want that. Give me something, doc, you know, and- Even that uh, has changed, you know. Uh, when I started out in this business, people would shop for a doctor who would give their child or the fever an antibiotic. And the doctors knew if they didn't give an antibiotic to that child, which they knew probably didn't need it, that person's gonna go down the street and see another doctor and get an antibiotic there. But it's really changed. I'd say in the last, over the, gradually over the last five or 10 years, but maybe in the last five years ago, parents have become more and more aware of overuse of antibiotics. Mm -hmm. And I see that now more and more where yeah, the, 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 the moms realize, not just the moms, the parents realize that there's a place for antibiotics and there's a place to not use antibiotics. And that's become wonderfully more acceptable in recent years. So maybe the media gets some credit for that, huh? I think so. Maybe so. <laughs> <laughs> but the other problem is, of course, many of these the more resistant bugs that we're seeing, the uh, New Delhi metallobetalactamase producing organisms uh, coming from overseas where they do sell these drugs over the counter. So we always have to be on alert for them because they get into this country and if they do get transmitted, they're almost impossible to treat. So, so is that a bigger problem overseas with the, the uh, not superbugs, the uh, antibiotic resistant bugs? Yeah, I think so. I think that the United States is a recipient of many of them over the years. I know uh, the first cases of uh, methicillin resistant staph came out of Denmark and Sweden and Australia, I think all of those countries and uh, reached here in the 70s. And now some of these new ones, uh, are, are coming here this last summer, actually, the NDM1s and the BMIs and that, they come from Pakistan and India and some other countries. So mm. yeah, I think we're a recipient, but I think we delve out our, our fair share as well. So, mm. so the fourth one uh, on our scary topic list is the, uh, the avian flu. Uh, Eddie, you and I talked a little bit about that before, before we went on the camera. Um, and it's kind of tricky because it's changing all the time, I guess, right? Well, I think influ what Mike was mentioned earlier that influenza is one of the most dangerous diseases in the world, and that's due to its ability to mutate. It can change fairly rapidly. Every year we see a minor change in the virus, and that's why we have to make a new vaccine each year. But about three times a century, uh, it can mutate uh, drastically. It's what we call recombination, but the, the uh, the bugs mutate in such a way that most humans are virgin to it, and as a result, you get a worldwide epidemic from it. Influenza is a nasty disease, and I think that uh, Mike hit on it a while ago that uh, it's it's very preventable on an annual basis. But what we're constantly watching out for is a mutation and the origin of influenza appears to be migratory birds. There's about 144 different strains circulating in mi migratory birds. Humans have only had six of those. Hmm. So we're constantly watching birds who get influenza. Now, the migratory birds don't get sick when they get it, but they can transmit it to uh, domestic birds like chickens and turkeys and ducks and that kind of thing. So uh, it's not only a concern of it mutating and infecting humans, it's a problem with the poultry industry because uh, when they, they, uh, you get a highly pathogenic uh, uh, avian flu, you can wipe out that industry. So they have to cull other birds. And so it presents a real concern. But the main thing that we watch it for is to see if it can, uh, you know, if that bug in the birds mutates either in a human or another animal like a pig. A pig can become a mixing vessel for an avian influenza, a swine influenza, human influenza, and you come out with a whole new virus. And if that infects humans, uh, then it becomes a, a concern worldwide because there's, there wouldn't be a vaccine available right away. So we call that pandemic flu worldwide influenza. Hmm. All right. There's a story that goes with that <clears throat> in that as 
and I've watched this happen over the years too, as we've recognized these things that Eddie's talking about, there's been a worldwide response among virology experts, at both in the United States through the Centers for Disease Control and with the World Health Organization. So now we have sentinel laboratories all over the world looking for these new strains that might appear that may be of danger to humans. And there's been a number of them that have been watched really closely for a long time and fortunately haven't emerged as a big problem. But it's such that now when a new strain appears, within 48 hours, the whole virus is sequenced. We know the exact wow. structure of the virus wow. um, in a way that allows uh, for uh, development of vaccines and testing for uh, antiviral agent resistance. We now have some antiviral drugs, not just antibacterial antibiotics, but antivirals now for influenza. Um, and so the, uh, there's a whole, we're being protected by a whole world of uh, experts who are sort of watching for these kinds of emerging strains. So they're monitored very carefully, both in the, uh, the, in the bird and the domestic bird population and in the human population. Because mm. as Eddie mentioned, there's a potential for a, a bird strain to become human, but very rarely does it actually happen. Mm. All right, well, let's talk about something that's more common. And that's uh, since it's summer and people are gonna be outside more, and, and I got one of these uh, a couple weeks ago, and, you know, it's ticks. And so we only have uh, about a minute and a half left. So what do people need to know about ticks? Like, how, how do you get rid of them, and okay, how do you know if you have uh, something really bad? Uh, all right, well, that's a lot for a minute. But, uh, <laughs> most importantly is um, uh, prevention and proper removal. There clearly are several very serious uh, tick-borne diseases that can occur, and we do see those. If they're recognized early, they can be treated. Mostly, it's a, they're ones that give you a fever that is not explained and not responding to the usual antibiotics. At that time, most doctors will be able to make the diagnosis and get a child on the right, and it usually is children, uh, some adults, uh, get them on the right antibiotic, and it can be life-saving. I guess the most important lesson is how to remove a tick. So one thing is to do inspections. If a person's been out in the wild or in the brush uh, at the end of the day, make sure that you check yourself or your children for ticks. And when you find one, uh, there are many wrong ways to remove it. <laughs> uh, the best way is to find a tweezers or some equivalent of that. And uh, if this is the tick attached to my leg, is to put the tweezers right at the base where the tick is attached and hold it, and then you pull up straight away from the skin, it makes a tent for a second or two, and then it pulls away. You do not handle it with your bare hands because you can actually get disease through your fingertips from, from the tick. And if you don't have such an instrument, you might be able to do it with a, uh, you know, a protective piece of cloth or something, it's, it's considered to be the next best way if you have to do it that way. Uh, and if the tick is removed within 24 hours of its attachment, uh, most of this seriousness can be prevented. So there are two main serious diseases, one called Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever and the other one called Ehrlichiosis, but they both present with a fever that doesn't respond, and both of them ha can have a characteristic rash, which is a real tip-off if it's present. Is, the, is, is one of them Lyme? Is that the er Ehrlich? Lyme disease is a tick-borne disease. I'm glad you asked this question because it's very sensitive to me. That does not occur in Missouri. Ah. People have been searching for it, and that's another one of these myths <laughs> that's perpetrated that we're here to break today, right? Right. Uh, it just, I have yet to see a case of Lyme disease that occurs in Missouri. I've had four cases. I've had one from Germany, one from the East Coast, uh, and um, one that I, uh, two from the East Coast, and one that I saw when I was a camp doctor up in the uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota area. So if you're from New England, Wisconsin, Minnesota, or a little bit on the far west coast, that's where the Lyme disease exists. The entire southeast United States was thought at one time to have Lyme disease. There's a rash that kind of looks like Lyme disease that's been confusing. But now we now know that is not Lyme disease. So I teach our young doctors, if the patient hasn't been to a Lyme area, don't even do the test. Because if you do tests in a population that has no Lyme disease, when you get a positive, it'll be a false positive. Right. And then they show up at my clinic and it takes <laughs> me 45 minutes to undo the diagnosis. Right. right, yeah. All right, well, I think we're out of time. This has been terrific. So much information packed into 30 minutes. So uh, really, I thank you. Thank you for oh, joining me, you. Dr. Cooperstock, Eddie. And um, we'll see you next month. <laughs>